Good morning, everybody. Um, and I want to say a big thank you uh, to the CUSP organizers. It's really fun uh, to be at a design conference. I, I give a lot of talks at, at energy conferences, and everyone's on a mission, and they're developing their project, and they're working on their policy. And it's really nice that they've created a, a safe space to be creative and be really human. So thank you to all the organizers. I thought I'd be a little bit provocative and say that for those of us working on the clean energy transition, I don't think that design is our problem. And I'm going to explain what I mean by that so I don't upset you all. A little bit of, of, of background before I get into that. Um, I recently uh, moved back to the, the farm that I grew up on in upstate New York. And I had lived overseas, I'd lived in different parts of the US, and, I, and for the last about 12 years I lived in Washington, DC. And so the last thing on earth I expected to do was move back to my family's farm. You know, it's an interesting time for me of reflection, um, and it was interesting looking at the cusp materials to see that they basically summed me up as, you know, Suzanne is all about the energy transition. And I thought, you know, that's really funny, because when I was a kid, you know, I was one of those kids, like I think a lot of the presenters, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to work on, and I did work on endangered species protection, water quality, air quality. You know, I, uh, I had a plan, um, and I remember telling the governor, this was the governor of New York when I was about 10, um, and, you know, there's a crowd of people, and someone introduced me, and I think my mom pushed me up there to meet the governor. He said, oh, little girl, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I think he was a little bit shocked when I explained my plan to get my, a degree in environmental science, and then I was going to go either into environmental policy or environmental law. I wasn't sure which. And, um, so, was, I, so I remember that at least age 10, I, I had this plan. And everything was going as planned until about 10 years ago. I was hired to manage a biofuels project. And I had wanted to work on all of these issues, and I needed to narrow it down a little bit, because you can't work on everything. So I figured I would work on everything except for energy. I was going to leave energy to the engineers. I wasn't going to work on energy. So things kind of got off track about 10 years ago when I got hired by the World Watch Institute to manage a global biofuels research project. And we, we produced this book, and it was quite an incredible experience working with experts from around the world. Um, and biofuels are really interesting because biofuels sit at the nexus of many of the world's most vexing challenges. They sit at the nexus of global geopolitics, of wealth inequality and wealth distribution. You can make biofuels from waste. Municipal solid waste is a huge problem, garbage, huge problem in the world. You can take garbage and turn it into clean burning fuels for airplanes, for trucks. Um, you can also um, burn and cut down pristine rainforest that are, that's producing incredible ecosystem services that's harboring biodiversity. Um, and you can destroy that and plant oil seeds and do more harm than the current fossil fuels, which are pretty darn harmful. Basically, petroleum is you know, one of the, the things in the world that has been used to generate incredible wealth. Exxon, last time I checked, was the most profitable company in the history of humanity. You know, oil generally means wealth, which generally means power. Anytime the oil price spikes, it, it affects the entire global economy. So I started working on biofuels which for transportation, which is an alternative to oil. So you start getting into how oil wealth affects governments, how it affects societies. I took the picture in the middle from a book called The Oil Curse, um, and folks in, in the international development community talk about the oil curse. Um, they talk about countries like Norway that had a strong democracy in place before they discovered their oil, and other countries like Venezuela that didn't, and the difference in how those countries develop based on where that oil wealth goes. Biomass, broadly, is one of the main sources of energy in the entire world. So, you know, there are... It was interesting yesterday to hear some of the speakers talking about smartphones, and they said, basically, everyone has a smartphone. Well, basically, everyone maybe in the U.S. does, but globally, people, and, and it's, it's amazing, there are now more cell phones in the world than people. So basically, almost everyone on the Earth can contact everyone else on the Earth through a cell phone, but 1.5 billion people don't actually have electricity. So they have to walk down the street to uh, pay to have their phone charged on someone's car battery unless um, someone has, has been... Uh, getting solar panels and other things out there. There are implications, huge implications with energy in terms of societal development. Um, you know, there are still hundreds of millions of women and girls that spend a huge amount of their time just gathering wood and charcoal, and half of the population in many parts of the world don't get to go to school because they're gathering basic um, wood to meet their basic needs. Um, millions and millions of women and girls die prematurely because of the smoke they inhale from the cook stoves. So, Energy touches all of us, it touches everything. 
This picture I took when I spent a couple days on an aircraft carrier with the United States Navy a few years back, it really is badass. Like, watching this is incredible. So, in working in advanced renewable fuels that have to fly those planes with absolute and total precision, there's absolutely no room for error. The United States military is the largest purchaser of petroleum products in the world. And I'm very proud to say that every branch of the United States military now has a major renewable energy and efficiency goal. The Navy has a, uh, a target in place to reduce their petroleum use by a half by 2020. Um, so, big part of the problem, hopefully big part of the solution. So, I don't want to utterly and totally depress everyone, but I thought I should at least outline the climate challenge a little bit before I start talking about some of the solutions and some of the ways that design does and doesn't play a role in these solutions. So I chose this particular graph. It doesn't show all of the greenhouse gas emissions. It doesn't show where they all come from, but it starts right about the time I, that picture was taken of me and Governor Cuomo. So you can see in the last 25 years, greenhouse gas emissions have gone up and up and up and up and up. And so what we generally talk about is how we have to reduce the rate of emissions and we have to reduce the rate at which they're growing. But what that doesn't show you and what I want to really make sure that everyone understands is that we're not starting from scratch every year. Those pollutants go up into the atmosphere and they stay there for quite a long time. So there's this accumulative effect. So a colleague of mine in the aviation space put this graph together for some meetings we had a few weeks ago. And I thought it was really helpful because it shows this is the growth in emissions, but they just keep growing even if we reduce the rate that they're growing, even if we cut them. So the global aviation sector has committed to voluntary, there's no teeth in these, but, but voluntary efficiency targets. Um, and they also have a, they have a goal to cut their emissions by 50% by 2050. And so when you look at the graphs of emissions, they show this deep cut. But when you actually look at what's happening in the atmosphere, even if you look at the green line, even if the, every single airline meets this voluntary target, which is not likely, the emissions still grow and grow and grow in the atmosphere. And this is just one industry. So imagine that across the entire economy. Just because I know you guys are design folks, you're visual, we're all visual creatures. This is a video that NASA put together that shows what the accumulation of these greenhouse gases is doing to the average global temperature. So it starts at the beginning of the industrial era and goes till 2011. So these aren't my words. Climate change is the challenge of our time. Many politicians, many world leaders have said this, many corporate leaders, um, a whole lot of folks um, have said that. We also have our leading scientists telling us that we have to leave the vast majority of the fossil fuels that are in the earth right now in the earth. We have to stop digging them up and we have to stop burning them. As I was thinking about what I wanted to share with you today, you know, the news you know, all the way here last week, this morning in the hotel, the news is about this Syrian refugee crisis, and um, our military and militaries around the world, folks are preparing for massive waves of climate refugees. As sea level rises, most people nowadays live in cities, and most cities are on coasts. Glaciers are melting that provide the drinking water for major, major population centers. The impetus for rapid and powerful action is pretty incredible. So now that I've depress everybody, a little bit of humor. I feel like this is a pretty brilliant way of explaining that we are essentially cooking ourselves. We are cooking the planet, we are cooking ourselves and all of the frogs and other creatures along with us. So, you know, it was interesting when Dave did his introduction yesterday and he was saying, we are putting rovers on Mars, we are doing these incredible things, and yet there are these basic fundamental crises facing humanity that we haven't been able to solve. As I reflect and I think, wow, they think I'm all about the energy transition. I guess I am all about the energy transition, and this is why. You know, there are so many different ways to look at the climate challenge and what's driving it and how you attack it. But if you look at it, the most basic and fundamental level, the greenhouse gas pollution is coming from our energy sector, it's coming from industry transport, and it's basically coming from the fuels that we currently use to power the economy, whether it's powering our buildings, powering transport, powering industry. So two-thirds of the problem is energy, and one-third is forestry and agriculture. It's land use, it's how we use our land. So essentially, 
we have to transition off of fossil fuels, and we have to learn how to manage our land in a way that's regenerative and not essentially just an extractive industry on the surface. So part of why I don't get out of bed depressed every single day is that we do have an incredible number of solutions. We'll certainly innovate and we'll create many more, but we have amazing solutions already today. This is a greenhouse at the Stone Barn Center. We can grow an incredible amount of incredibly nutritious, delicious food on small areas of land with some knowledge, a little bit of infrastructure, and good seeds. These are solar panels. These are the, the guys putting the solar panels in at my family's farm this summer. Solar has been around for decades. It is powering the satellites that are sending information to our cell phones. There's no maintenance, you put them up. The ones we're using are American and German made. They have 25-year warranties. What else in the world has a 25-year warranty? I don't know, but these things will just sit there and they will produce clean power every day, unless they're covered in snow. Brilliant technologies, they've been around for decades. This picture of the fuel pump was in 2007 when I did a spoof biofuel road rally and we drove from Washington, D.C. down to, through Central America and, and to Costa Rica. This, we stopped at a tilapia fish farm where they were taking the leftover fish fat and turning it into biodiesel to run all of their trucks and all of their other vehicles. Super simple, I was in a 1981 pickup tr diesel pickup truck and it ran beautifully. Uh, on old fish fat turned into biodiesel. Just when I was on my way to Chicago the other day, Bloomberg had an article out, wind is now the cheapest way to make electricity in Germany and the UK. It's also the cheapest way to make electricity in other parts of the world. Um, Texas is the biggest wind state in America. Interesting tidbit, if you didn't know that. I don't even remember where I took the bicycle picture. It's some city in Europe, cities everywhere. In the 12 years I lived in Washington, I went from being nearly run off the road on my bicycle to now there's bike shares, bike lanes, bike parking. Amazing, convenient, super simple technology solution. So if we think of all the women and girls and, and, and people that have to, to gather wood for energy. This is a company called Nocaro uh, that makes solar-powered lights. My friends at EarthSpark International are setting up stores in Haiti and selling these technologies, and they're setting up solar microgrids and so, so many solutions that are viable already. I'm also not discouraged about this massive crisis that we're facing because there are so many companies that are working on this, so many governments, so many organizations. These are just a few that I've worked with over the years, and there's so many more. I hesitate to bring up the media, but regardless of how you feel or your experience with the media, they are covering these issues. These are just a few of the media outlets that have covered my work over the years and my colleagues' work. They will cover it. These are brilliant stories. So with all this human brilliance, with all of these solutions that already exist, why have we not solved the climate crisis? It's been interesting to think about this, and you know, there are projects and initiatives that I've been involved in over the years that had absolutely no chance of success. Everyone told us we were idiots to even try, and they were incredible successes. And then I've been part of projects, and I'm sure you all have, that should have been a cakewalk. They should have worked no problem, and they fall apart. Take a minute and just think about what helped those projects succeed. What were the reasons for their failure if they failed? So I'm just going to flash through a few things that came to mind, and then I'm going to go into some, some examples from, um, from over the years. So money, double-edged sword. We all have different experiences with the money. It can be incredibly helpful in helping us achieve our goals. It can also be something that makes things weird, and people, you know, greed comes in, and it breaks things apart, and it can be just an incredibly destructive force when it becomes the reason for doing something rather than the resource that helps us do what we're trying to do in the world. Probably don't need to say anything about this. My psychologist friends tell me that when you're about three years old, you start to develop the sense of self. You start to realize that your identity is separate from your mother. Um, and we develop this sense of ego. It's something that's very useful in our lives and can also be very destructive depending on how it's managed. So fear is an interesting one. I've been you know, helping my family put solar on our farm and winery and working with some other wineries. I have friends that have been doing solar for years and years and years. When Thomas Edison designed, invented the first electricity utility in New York State, ever since then, we have had the same type of electricity grid. You guys probably turn on your lights, you charge your, your electronics, and you don't think about where the, the electricity comes from. Because for the entire history of electricity, it has come from big utilities made at large generation facilities, and it's come out through the grid to us. 
And now we are in the middle of this revolution where they're going, you know, like Germany ha is, has been doing, they went from having 500 points of generation for electricity in 2000 to 2015 where they had um, over a million because everyone can start to be their own, produce their own power. And that's completely different. We're putting power into the grid when it used to come the other direction. There's smart grid technologies, smart thermostats. It's a whole new world. It's very scary if you're an electricity utility that's been doing things the same way for a long time. Um, and so there are a lot of utilities that are scared of the future, and they are either cannot or will not change. And then there are a few that see this as an opportunity. They are changing and they are going to prosper and they're doing an amazing job. In terms of when I think about the projects that were the most successful, that they were most personally transformative and best for the world, you know, it's probably collaboration, dedication, and leadership that come to mind first. There's lots of other things, but those were just three I'll throw out there. And then I want to get into what I think the real problem is. So coming here to talk to a bunch of designers, I think you know, there's such incredible skills, and we really need design thinking and design skills in tackling all these challenges. But when I think back to, to where we've had successes and where we've had failures, it's really not for a lack of brilliant design. It's not for a lack of brilliant technologies. It's our inability to work together. It's a real human problem. It's a problem of the heart. It's a problem of culture. So I'll give you a few examples. So instead of speaking just in broad terms, let me give you some real examples. So this is my friend, Tony DeZino. And I met Tony through my friend, Dave Myers. He's a brilliant design thinker. And these guys love tackling some of the biggest challenges and thinking about them in completely new ways. And one of the beautiful things that I've seen Tony teach his students and one of the things um, that I've seen him teach kids in really tough situations, in the mountains of Afghanistan, in the Black Hills of South Dakota, he says, you know, anyone can learn to be a photojournalist, anyone can learn to use a camera. The important thing is what story you choose to tell. And I think this translates in so many different ways, but in, when we're thinking about design challenges and technology challenges, you know, what design challenge you choose to put your time and talent towards is, is absolutely essential. You know, the, I worked with uh, some of these uh, really innovative design guys in the automotive industry. When we think of design, you know, that's automotive design is one of those really sexy, really exciting things. Well, if you look at the years between 1985 and 2005, the fuel efficiency of the American car fleet did not improve at all. It actually went down at times. And so they were choosing to design, I love music, but better stereos, cooler looking things. I don't know what they were doing, but they were not improving the, the fuel efficiency at all. They also more than doubled it in less than 10 years in the decade prior. Throw up a picture of a Tesla because Henry Ford is quoted with saying, when, when he asked people what they wanted, they would tell him, we want faster horses. And so of course, he didn't invent faster horses, he invented a whole new way of getting around. And so I, I bring up the Tesla because I think Elon Musk did something, something very similar. He said, I'm not going to make mediocre cars slightly less mediocre. I'm going to redesign the entire driving experience. I'm going to redesign the whole way that the car is powered. And those batteries are going to integrate with the grid to help store energy from the sun and wind and other clean sources. So he, he wants to sell you the car, and he wants to sell you batteries for your house and the solar panels to charge the batteries. So now we're no longer dependent on the oil industry. We're also no longer dependent on the electricity utilities that either cannot or will not adapt to our needs and the needs of the world today. Another one of these beautiful, beautiful teachers in the world is a man named Peter Yarrow. For the older folks in the room, you'll remember him as Peter from Peter, Paul, and Mary. So Peter is one of the people that I love to think about when I think about these impossible challenges. We've worked together over the years on, on a number of issues. This is a, a unity concept that he and, and his daughter Bethany Yarrow and a number of Lakota elders and, and folks from many different tribes, many different ages, came together. It's the most incredibly collaborative process I've ever been a part of. Um, and he taught so much to all of us during this this collaborative process. I mean, he teaches lots of things. He teaches about the importance of music, but also s making music together. Not just sitting and watching other people, but the, the real power of making music together. But one of the things that I wanted to share with the design community is that when he's using music as a tool for social change, when he's using music as a tool to help bring people together um, in really tough situations, he teaches that it's not about the flash, it's not about you know, your cool new, you know, cool new songs, it's about the intention behind that music. 
And I think that carries over to everything that we do. It's the intention behind the work that we do um, that carries it forward and that, that helps determine what impact it will have. It's so interesting to hear him talk about the stories of the civil rights movement. So he was, he was you know, he and Peter, Paul, and Mary sang Blowing in the Wind, and they stepped back from the microphone, and Martin Luther King gave the I Have a Dream speech. They got death threats. They were told that it was impossible to end segregation, and now it just seems, you know, it's hard for us to even conceive of segregation. So I love to, I love to um, learn from these elders and really apply, you know, what they, the, the lessons and the tools that they used when they were facing these equally impossible challenges. So an example of one of the recent battles that, that was fought that seemed impossible and we ended up succeeding was the battle over fracking in New York State. About eight years ago, I was home visiting and I was working with the local cooperative extension agency heads and we were going to develop renewable energy education materials for all the different cooperative extension offices across upstate New York. And I got there and they all wanted to talk about fracking. I said, you know, I don't know, I don't, I don't, what is this fracking thing? I, I work on clean energy. And then three weeks later, uh, it came out that one of the oil and gas companies that was fracking in Pennsylvania um, had worked in secret with a local town official um, to get permission to bring 50 tanker trucks a day to bring toxic flowback fluids um, from the fracking in Pennsylvania, and they were going to inject it in the ground um, about a mile and a half from our farm. And so people went berserk, and they, they were able to stop it. But then I really started looking at this. And in 2008, we all know what happened. Um, States were really strapped for cash. There's, thanks to some loopholes in national energy legislation, there's no federal oversight whatsoever. So it's up to the states to regulate this stuff. The states were you know, strapped for cash. They didn't have you know, the wherewithal to, to really properly police this industry. So the people in New York State just said no. They just said the risks do not outweigh the benefits. The risks to all of us and to our health and to the water do not outweigh the benefits to a few. And it was scientists and filmmakers and celebrities and thousands and thousands of just regular people became activists. They were not professional environmentalists. They were not professional activists. They just said no, and they worked together, and they worked for years, and they succeeded. And everyone told us that we were just absolutely silly to even take on this challenge. So I love this example. There's books being written about it. There's so much more I could say about it. I was going to show you pictures that I took at a wind farm in Europe and pictures I took at a wind farm in the US, and then I realized that they, they look basically the same. The physical design is basically the same. What's so totally different about the, the two wind farms that I want to tell you about is how the revenue streams from these wind farms were, how, how the, the system of paying for and then using the revenues from these wind farms was designed. So in one of these cases, the community brought in outside capital, they used some town monies, they built the wind farm, and then they used all the revenue that they got back um, for community projects. So they built a clean heating system for the entire community. Um, they invested in a community center, um, and they did all these really wonderful things for the community. And then there was another community wind project where um, each of the families that invested in it just got the money straight back. And some of those families used the money to invest in other renewable energy projects. Some of them teamed up and, and, and formed small investment groups, and they invested in all kinds of different things. And then a number of the families um, over the years started fighting over the money. And now there are families out there that, in this particular community that um, can't even have you know, a Christmas dinner together or a pick the holiday or pick the religion. It has ruined these families because it became about the money and who gets what instead of going from a situation where many of the, you know, there were some of the farms were actually at risk of, you know, the, lose, some of the families were at risk of losing their farms. And so this beautiful thing that should have been a, you know, a beautiful way to save the farm became uh, uh, something that tore families apart. I feel like people have been talking about how we design a new culture. And I think that there's so much now in this day and age where we have to learn how to live with each other and we have to learn how to live on this earth without destroying the systems that support life. There's so much that we can learn from ancient societies. I think we're all focused, there's so much talk about technologies and things, but there's so much wisdom. And just one of the little bits of wisdom that some of my Native American friends share often is just walk in beauty. This picture was taken uh, at the Unity concert this year. Um, Leroy Comes Last was um, leading a workshop 
where women were helping other women um, figure out, and, and men figure out how to break the cycle of domestic violence and alcoholism that stems out of the historic trauma that stems from centuries of genocide. Um, and it was literally just collaborative, community, listening, it, beautiful, be so much beautiful, beautiful things to learn. We are very brain-focused society. We're very focused on smarts and cleverness, but we make terrible decisions with our big brains when we don't actually have influence from our hearts. So I would just um, hope that we can um, really listen to our hearts while we're designing. Um, and I'll just leave you with a few questions. I'll, I'll just let you guys read these. Just to bring it full circle, this is my family's farm and winery that I moved back to. We are doing our best to uh, reduce our impact on, on the climate, and uh, I hope you'll all come visit. So, thank you. <laughs>